Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Varieties of services, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the work of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of those tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of the one Spirit. And then the Gospel of Matthew, I really wanted just to read verse 20 of chapter 18, but I think it needed a little context. Matthew 18, beginning at 15. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. So I was trying to picture there in the upper room just before, uh, just as the Pentecost celebration kind of begins, the festival, uh, the disciples are gathered in the upper room, and I'm trying to picture Peter, Mary Magdalene, James, other followers of Jesus working together in the upper room trying to draw up the bylaws for the new church, you know, that's about to happen. Just thinking, you know, we really ought to get this down on paper. Peter is adamant, you know, it's, it's only for Jews. It's Jews only, can't have anybody else joining. John seems to be open to outsiders. Mary Magdalene wants a paragraph in the bylaws about the role of women in this new thing they're going to do. And James is busy working on the finance uh, section of the document. Others debating whether they ought to worship in the synagogues, whether they should build their own sanctuary, or maybe they should still do what Jesus had done, and that is just worship together on the hillside or in somebody's house. How do you form a totally new entity? And what do you call it? Do you call it church? Do you call it the way? Do you call it Christ people? No, I'm just kind of imagining that, right? But... What would it be to draw this group of people that were there together and those gathered in Jerusalem? What would gather them together? The varieties of people and nations, diverse group of uh, social strata. What would bring them together in a unified community? Well, these early followers did not have to have that discussion that I imagined. Because suddenly, as Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit comes blazing like fire and blowing like the wind, and all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. And there it is, the church. All of them filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what unites them. It's the birth of the church, is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the community of Christians. We need a reminder, and Pentecost is a great day to be reminded, that it is Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who creates the community of faith. 
It wasn't the disciples hanging around and saying, you know what, we really ought to start a church. You know, we came together, we have enough followers now, maybe we ought to start a church. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit that unites them and forms the church. It's the presence of Christ that transforms the community from being just a gathering of people into the unique and holy body that it is. In other words, it may be a common interest in fitness that draws a group of runners together. It may be a common concern about fighting cancer that leads people to say, hey, I'm going to join the American Cancer Society. It's when that folks have kids in school that they say, you know, we're part of the PTA. But in the church, it's so much more than just a group of people uh, sharing a common interest or a common concern or a common life situation that forms the church. No, we are a community of people because we share the same Holy Spirit. Christ forms us into the body. We are the body of Christ. Another metaphor, we are the family of God. We are the family of Christ, the household of God. So look around you. Go ahead, look around you. There's your sisters and your brothers right there. We're family, your sisters and brothers. And the sisters and brothers in Christ, you may not have much in common with them, but you have the Holy Spirit is the commonality. And it's not just in this local body, right? It's worldwide. We, it's a global family. We have relatives in Kentucky and in Kenya and in Kathmandu. We have church relatives. We have black sisters and yellow brothers and brown cousins. We're joined by Christ. That's what unites us. In God's economy, it's through this community of faith that Christ comes to us Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ present. To gather in the name of Christ means to share this common devotion to Christ. Now, we can't gather the whole global community, and so we meet in local congregations and smaller family groups in order to be in community. We come together as people who have consciously placed ourselves in the direction of Jesus' name to honor and obey the person of Christ. And so we, when we meet in these little Christ-centered groups, Jesus said, I'm going to be there. I'll be there too. I will be present. The qualifications are not that we are all going to like each other. There might be somebody in this room you don't like so much. I hope it's not me, but there might be somebody. <laughs> There's nothing in the qualifications of the church that says we are all going to agree with each other. And we certainly are not going to look alike, act alike, live alike, or worship alike. The qualification is that we have a common dedication to Jesus Christ who gives us the Holy Spirit. We come to church for a variety of reasons, but it needs to be remembered that it's for the common faith in Christ. Now, we live in a culture that's uh, really into individualism. I mean, just the names, you know, iPhone, iPad, and so on. It's all I. It's me. It's mine. And this I-ness infects our culture, but we bring that to church. And then it gets confusing. I thought we are talking about community. I just taught a class on community, and hope maybe you'll come in the next few weeks to that class. And there's this pendulum of, you know, the freedom of the self and then this pure community, and uh, unfortunately, we as a culture are way over into just, it's all about personal freedom, it's all about me and mine, and we've lost that sense of community. And then we bring that to church, and it's still all about the individualism. It's what, what I want, and, and, and it's what, you know, what songs I want to sing and which service I want to attend, and which mission things I think we should be doing, and all the rest. We, we, we want to say, you know, what's the, what's the church doing for me? Or we say it in the negative, they're not doing things the way I like. And so when our individual personal needs, concerns, desires supersede our devotion to Christ, 
when they take us away from the Spirit, then that sense of community is marred. I said that I wanted to just read that one verse from Matthew. Part of the reason is, did you, did you hear the context? This is, you know, happy day celebrating Pentecost, and Matthew's talking about when we disagree or when, when someone sins against another. In other words, it's about conflict among the people. It's about church discipline. And it's, that's the context for when he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And the point is, hey, you need to resolve your differences, resolve when things uh, go against one another, because you're disrupting the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And we have created this spirit, this community of faith, essentially Jesus is saying, we've created this community, and it's for our own good and enjoyment, and so don't do anything that's going to you know, splinter the group. Do everything in our power to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, is the way Ephesians 4 put it. Do everything to keep the community going. So we do not create the church. We do not create our sense of community. But we are to be at work trying to maintain what the Spirit has created. Keep that unity going. Community, Christian community is is a gift to us. Christ says, here, here's the church. Now, now, why would he give us the church? You know, we can just do this thing on our own. We can, you know, worship on our own. People say, you know, we, I can be spiritual but not need the church. That's, I don't think that's true. We need community. It's the church family that nurtures our faith. It's the church that teaches us how to pray, and it supports us in life's challenges or guides us in life choices. It shares our joy, equips us to be Christ's representative in the world. So the church does all of these things. This community we need. We need this community. Yeah, we need some time apart, but we need the community. For all of the, it's a community of love. So if you don't need any love in your life, just go it alone. Okay, good luck. We need this community of love, of Christ's love not an option. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his classic book, Life Together, he says, there is so much blessing and joy in even a single encounter of Christian with Christian. Therefore, how inexhaustible are the riches that open up for those who by God's will are privileged to live in the daily fellowship of life with other Christians. The riches that open for those, up for those who by God's will are privileged to live in the daily fellowship of life with other Christians. So in that class, I gave them a little bit of time just to talk about some of the joys and the things that came out in the community. I had to break in the conversation. People were sharing what they gained from being in community. So Bonhoeffer says, Therefore, let the one who has had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians Praise God's grace from the bottom of his heart. Let the one who has had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians praise God's grace from the bottom of his heart. When we come to this table, it's about communion, isn't it? It's about community. I want to read to you as an invitation to the Lord's table this peace. And it talks about communion. Now he's talking about community. He's he's talking about the uh, fellowship that we have in the church. But he's using that word communion. And so I intentionally want us to be thinking about this communion and then our communion with one another. He says to be in communion means to be with someone. So here we are, we're with someone. And to discover what we actually, that we actually belong together. Communion means accepting people just as they are, with all their limits and inner pain, but also with their gifts and their beauty and their capacity to grow, to see the beauty inside of all the pain. To love someone is not, first of all, to do things for them, but to reveal to them their beauty and value to say to them through our attitude, you are beautiful, 
you are important. I trust you. You can trust yourself. To love someone is to reveal to them their capacities for life, the light that is shining in them. This is communion, you see. This is community. This is what we do for one another. But now listen again to some of that and think not just of one another, but think of this communion is with Christ. To be in communion means to be with someone. It's to be with Christ and to discover that we belong together. We belong to Christ. We belong to one another. Communion means accepting people just as they are. Christ accepting us just as we are with all our limits and even with our inner pain but with also the gifts of their beauty and their capacity to grow. Christ sees the beauty inside of us, even despite our pain. To love someone, so now we're thinking Christ loving us, is not, first of all, to do things for them, but to reveal to them their beauty and value, to say to them, so here's Christ saying this to you. You are beautiful, you are important, I trust you and you can trust yourself. And so he gives the invitation to come to the table, to come into communion with him, to be in communion with one another at this, the Lord's table. So we gather together.